right. Good evening, everybody. Uh, we'll get started here in just a second. Thank you all for joining me this evening. This is the Good News Doctor. And today, the good news is I'm going to remind you how amazing our bodies are and how wonderfully and fearfully we're made. And so I am committed to always be bringing you the good news about how we can heal and how we can overcome adversity. And so sometimes we have to bring some of the sad truth about what's really going on in our environment and in our lives with our lifestyle. But rest assured, I never bring sad truth without also backing it up with the good news about what we can do about these issues that we speak about. So tonight, I am so excited to be bringing you gut health and immunity. This is a topic that I'm very passionate about, as I'm sure you'll all see pretty soon as we get into the presentation. I've actually been looking forward to doing this presentation for quite a while. So with all of that, I am excited to bring to you gut health and immunity and help you understand some things about gut health and immunity that maybe you never really looked at it this way before. My purpose is to take some complicated issues and simplify them so that the average person can take that information and have maybe even an epiphany about that makes so much sense to me. Now I'm going to start treating my body a little bit differently. Maybe I'm going to draw a line in the sand when it comes to certain things. And maybe I'm going to be proactive about doing certain things to make sure that I can be the best me and the best version of me every time my cells replace themselves. So without further ado, I would like to help you by helping you understand a lot more about gut health and what that looks like. So let me go ahead and get this slideshow started. All right. So um, as we connect to the gut, the gut brain connection, Okay, so let's just talk a little bit about that. Most of us have, uh, you know, understanding how important our brain is and how the brain runs and regulates everything. However, the brain is just the CPU of your computer. Okay, your gut is also on the keyboard where all the data and all the information is sent to the brain so the brain can tell all the cells what to do with that information. So they're absolutely interconnected. And the gut has a microbiome that actually controls our immune response. And so good, healthy bacteria in our gut is critical for us to maintain a healthy immune response altogether. And that lining that makes up our gut replaces itself every three to five days. So this is really good news. When we find things that can actually help and change the way our gut functions, we can see turnaround happen very quickly. In fact, 95% of all chronic conditions out there can be turned around with diet alone just by making sure we get the right nutrients and start taking care of the important parts of our gut that really matter. So some things that you may not be aware of is all the little villi that we see here in this top picture is actually an image of the inside of your intestines. And we have all that surface area. In fact, the gut is, it's our biggest surface area of our, of our system that's exposed to the environment. The surface area of it is equivalent to two tennis courts. Now to put that into perspective, your skin is only about 1.8 meters if you laid it all out. So 1.8 meters of your skin is exposed, but two tennis courts of surface area is literally exposed to the environment because everything you're putting into your mouth and breathing in and comes in contact with your sinus cavities in your mouth is being exposed through that entire environment. And so that's pretty cool. And to, to make that even more complicated, that layer that separates the outside environment from all the internal processes of breaking down all of that, it's only one cell layer thick. So it's super fragile, but yet as big as a whole tennis court, okay? And so it's responsible for what gets let through that, think of it like saran wrap, what gets through that layer and what doesn't, okay? So, this is a great image to explain what tight junctions are. So in this picture right here, we're seeing a single cell neighboring another single cell. 
and that layer keeps going on and on and on and on. This is the one cell layer thick of that saran wrap. Now, only the little villi here at the top are the part that are exposed to the food, and that, that actually replaces itself every five minutes. How amazing is that? Now, in between the cells, we have these things called tight junctions, and you can see here that they're the little purple spot welds uh, that we see connecting two adjacent cells together. And it holds those cells super tight together so they can form a whole net. And that net doesn't let anything through there that's not supposed to get through there through the proper channels. Now, another thing that I want to point out right here is that um, the microbiome that's in the gut, that's outside that you know, safe space inside the cell, it acts like a cell tower. And it sends information inside the cell here to the mitochondria. And then the mitochondria make energy and the byproduct of making energy, like the exhaust of the car, is something called redox signaling molecules. And those open up these little channels called gap junctions, which I'll talk about more in a second, and share information between the cells. So the mitochondria is the cell phone and the bacteria up here is the cell phone antenna where we get the information and then we share that information between the cells to all be on the same page and know what's out there that's not good, that shouldn't be let in and so forth. So one of the most important parts of this whole sheet that covers and separates the two environments, that's only one cell layer thick, is the ability for the cells to stay glued together like Velcro, okay, and not let anything through this little space in between the cells. So we spot weld these little cells together up at the top near the microvilli up there and that prevents leaky gut and doesn't let the bad things in. Now, if I go back one slide here again and we look at these little fibers down here that are lower down on the cell away from all the food and everything else that's trying to be assimilated, these are what we call gap junctions. Now this is the part of the cell that is literally connecting two adjacent cells. And it almost looks like the aperture on a camera. And it's gonna open up and it exposes the environment from one cell to the other through the form of light energy. So it's like fiber optic cables in there. And that's how cells communicate from one cell to another using what's called redox signaling molecules to communicate. So it's important that the cell-to-cell -cell communication stays open and stays functioning. So again, we build a very strong net that doesn't let anything through and we can build, a, a, we're all on the same page as far as our immunity to know what's happening you know, in this environment. And so the image down here below is actually these gap junctions and showing uh, through a different type of imaging the light energy that travels from cell to cell. And so they're like fiber optics, and that's how cells communicate. So here's another picture of the, of the cell, and we can see this blue ribbon around here. That's the tight junctions. That's the Velcro that holds all the cells together. And then we can see these gap junctions here that, um, that allow the communication from cell to cell. Now, What's also important is to know that this replaces itself every three to five days and the surface every five minutes, like we said. So here's a picture, like an aerial view, looking down on top of those villi, and the green lines that we're seeing here are literally all the tight junctions. They're gluing all of those cells together, forming barriers, so only the, the dissolved food down to the molecules levels are getting through the, the pathways that they're supposed to get through and it's preventing the bad stuff from getting past our cells and past this barrier in essence in which we've built. Now let's switch our talk right now for a little bit and just start talking about our food and, and the process of our food and what it's going to do full circle back to those gap junctions. So in World War I and World War II, the government had a campaign and it was called Victory Gardens. And so this campaign was designed to help feed the troops because we just didn't have enough food to feed all the troops. And so by the end of the war, 45% of all the crops 
uh, grown in the United States were by individual farmers with like five acres or less. And so it wasn't big corporations making all the food for everybody. It was farmers. We were in touch with the earth. We touched the soil. It was grown in the soil. It was had minerals and so forth in the soil. And so things were good. And we, we were growing a lot of amazing and good quality food. And so, you know, everything kind of changed after that. And we're going to go into those changes. But the good news is, again, is we're only really one generation behind us growing our own food and being in touch with the soil versus millions of years that that was our only option is to grow our own food. And so uh, that's encouraging knowing that there is a plan to turn this around and to stop using the things that we're codependently, you know, um, using. So since then, we've learned to trade convenience for quality. And so, you know, it takes a lot of time to grow your own food and to process, you know, the cultivate it and all of that. And we just want to work more. And so we need a fast meal on the road and so forth. And we know what that means. And because of that, for the first time in all of history, wealthy people are skinny and the poor people are obese. And that's because we've made food that's not good quality, that's loaded with stuff that, that creates all sorts of damage in us and made it affordable to the poor. And the people with money are going back to the roots of let's grow our own food, let's eat organic, let's eat clean, let's try to get as many fruits and vegetables and the healthy stuff in us and avoid all this processed and, and fast food stuff and, and all of that. So, you know, the times have shifted. And the reason is because once World War II ended, we had a really crisis in our country and it was excessive petroleum. Think about it, how much petroleum we were producing to fuel all the army vehicles in the submarines and the airplanes and the tanks and all of that. And all of a sudden we had this excessive amount of petroleum that we couldn't use. And so they decided that we could extract some chemicals from that petroleum as in nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium and create a fertilizer that we called NPK. And this made our food green again and it helped, you know, things look pretty. But what happened was really is we started growing our food without the minerals and the natural medicine that we got from different weeds and from the soil. And so we started making the soil sick. And this became a problem. So when a plant's immunity becomes weak and sick, it's very susceptible to viruses and bacteria and bugs that it can't get its own immunity from the roots in the soil to keep all the, the weeds and stuff at bay. And so things started to get chaotic and they were losing crops because the weeds were overtaking them and things were getting out of hand. So rather than fixing the problem and getting back to natural soil, we said, hey, don't worry about that. We got pesticides and weed killers to handle that problem. And so now what's created is codependency on chemicals. We need chemicals to spray, um, you know, initially for pesticides and, and weed killers, we, or for fertilizer to grow the stuff, and then the pesticides and weed killers to combat, you know, how it's changing the structure of nature and our own natural nature's immune response to all of these things. And so what we're doing is we're really just masking a symptom rather than fixing the cause of the problem. Sounds kind of like how we treat medicine. We take one medication and unfortunately we're getting some side effects. We take another medication to mask the side effect of the first medication and so on and so on. And we're creating a sicker person that has more side effects. So on top of all of that, we decided, hey, we got a pesticide and it's called Roundup. In the 1980s, they commercialized it for home use, you know, for individual consumers, direct to consumer. We can be able to take care of our own bugs. So here's the problem. They had this commercial back then where they show this guy coming out of the garage with the backpack of Roundup on and two spray units, one like a pistol holder on each side. He's going out, he's spraying all of the, the dandelions and the things in his yard that actually are doing good things for the environment. But at any rate, on a side note, they've misused this product. They would go out there and spray a whole bottle in their little tiny backyard that a farmer could use on multiple acres. And so it created a, a massive problem. Roundup was killing everything. And so the solution to that was 
glyphosate. This is the active ingredient in Roundup. And what it did is it is it is it was used as a pesticide, but it's literally patented as an antibiotic. So what they're trying to do is they're trying to kill the weeds and the other plants, and it's actually an antibiotic. And so the way it works, it's designed to block the enzymes in a plant, in a soil, and in a bacteria. Okay. Now, why is that important? Or how does it do that exactly? There's something called the shikimate pathway. And this is a seven-step metabolic route that's used by bacteria, fungi, and algae. And it's used to biosynthesis folate and different amino acids like phenylalanine, tyrosine, and tryptophan. And so if the plants stop doing that, hmm, maybe we're going to have some side effects of that because those are actually really important that we have the ability to do that. But that's the process in which it does it. And they say that it's safe for humans because humans don't have the shikimate pathway. So it's inhibiting the shikimate pathway and that's how they get around it. But it's hurting the plants and making the plants sick and then we're eating the plants. And so it's doing other things to us that they haven't claimed or didn't know about or they knew about but didn't care or who knows the story but we know now exactly the process of what this does so if we take this image on the left we kind of showed you before what a tight junction is supposed to look like and we're supposed to see cell walls all around interlocking forming a net this product literally dissolves those tight junctions in the spot welds and literally breaks up all the cells so that's what leaky gut looks like this is destroying the membrane that's the barrier that keeps all the criminals in prison, you know, on the other side of that barrier so it doesn't affect all the healthy cells inside my whole, my whole organism. And so this is a problem, and we know this is a problem. And so unfortunately, in order to, you know, deal with what they've done with glyphosate, they just started genetically modifying our food so that it's not affected by glyphosate. Okay, well, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Again, we're not, um, we had these bacteria and things that were designed to protect the plant and to give the plant immunity. So we've destroyed the plant's immunity. Now we're growing plants artificially because they don't really have the nutrients in them that we're supposed to have or the flavors and so forth. And so now we create a GMO, again, to mask the problem rather, max this, max, mask it rather than fix the problem. So then we add on top of all of that, fungicides and pesticides at an alarming rate that is absolutely poisoning the food. So let's talk about GMOs for a second. So, you know, a lot of people are gluten-free, like myself, for almost two decades now. And, uh, you know, I do have celiac, so that was the motivation, is just not to activate this gene and so forth. But really, everybody just is kind of in denial that gluten's bad. No, I don't care if you have celiac or gluten intolerance or not. The gluten that you're eating is not real, okay? And it's not being taught and it's because it's everywhere. It's in everything. Gluten is what makes things moist and yummy like cake and cookies and candies and things. Um, you know, it, it, it forms inf inflammation under your skin in your whole body and it's going to create a bunch of havoc on your brain as well. So let's talk about why this happened and what wheat used to be like. So ancient wheat used to actually grow three feet tall, like you see in this picture on the left. Not only that, it actually produced seeds. And so the wind would carry the seeds and we would get crop after crop after crop. Well, Monsanto came in and they genetically engineered wheat so that it wouldn't be harmed by the glyphosate, and they engineered it to only grow a foot tall. As you see in the picture here on the right, this is being harvested and it's only a foot tall. And it doesn't produce seeds anymore because, of course, we want you to buy seeds from us. And so, and then they did a bunch of other things to genetically change it as well, and we're going to talk about that here on the next slide. So, ancient wheat only had 14 chromosomes. Very easy for us to break down, digest, and get carbohydrates and proteins out of. Well, this new GMO wheat has 96 chromosomes. They've made it into a very complex uh, organism, or not an organism, a, a complex plant, okay? Um, the, the next thing is the 20% that used to be gluten, or the 20% tw the of, the, of the wheat that is carbohydrate, one one thousandth of it is gluten in original wheat, and in this new wheat, 
We have over 10,000 glutens and nothing else forming the carbohydrates. This is a freak of nature. It was never designed to do that. Our bodies don't understand that. They don't look at it as something that's healthy or beneficial. It creates instant inflammation. It passes the blood-brain barrier, and it does a lot of harmful things to us. Ironically, I could actually eat wheat from other countries that's still the ancient wheat and not have any symptoms or side effects because our bodies were designed to be able to break that down and eat it. Now, on top of that, just actual raw sugar is only going to raise your blood sugar about 10 points. You eat a piece of bread, you'll see it spike 30 points. And so it's genetically engineered to get in and go in past these membranes because what it's doing is all these 10,000 glutens also destroys those tight junctions. So here's a control where we see the green lines here on the left of the screen. And this is a tight junction in between cells. And then the added gluten in, in just a few minutes, it starts to dissolve and break apart these tight junctions, creating leaky gut. Again, bad things getting into your blood that shouldn't be there. So what does leaky gut really mean? I hear these things all the time. I don't really know what it means. I don't leak out. <laughs> so it's leaking internal. And then I guess I just reabsorb it and it gets back in the system. You know, where's the drain? What's the leak thing all about? Well, we talked about that saran wrap, right? And one side of the saran wrap is up here with all the little villi. And the other end of the saran wrap is anchored down, <laughs> you know, onto your blood vessel. And so when those tight junctions open, we can see these foreign material can make its way and jump into the blood. That's a problem, okay? This can create all sorts of systemic inflammation, chronic problems, and, and everything else. So we have a barrier, a connection between the gut and the blood-brain barrier. Okay, these are all membranes. They're all very much interconnected. They all have the same tight junctions that separate things from getting from one to the other, and they're intimately connected, so they're all related. You can't have a sick gut and have a healthy brain at the same time, okay? That's important to understand. When you're abusing your body and eating the things you shouldn't be and you're destroying your gut, you're thinking, oh, I'm just gonna gain a few pounds, no worry, I'll just lose it next week. No, you're destroying the barrier between you and your organism, letting bad things in and the odds of you having a healthier version of you on your next time around, good luck with that, okay? It's not gonna happen. You're spending too much of your neurology and your energy and resources to try to get these bugs out and try to stop the infection and, and, and reduce inflammation, but it's happening at a chronic rate when you're abusing your body like that. It's like you're in a boat with leaking holes and you just keep bailing, but you're sinking as fast as you're bailing. How long can we keep up abusing our body? You're gonna digest over two tons of food in your lifetime. How hard do you wanna make that on your gut? I mean, really, give it a break sometimes. Think about this. All the little workers that are around that two surface areas, uh, two tennis courts of surface area, their whole job is to look for a certain mineral or a certain nutrient, like where I'm gonna get vitamin K, this worker over here, he's going for vitamin C, and everybody's got their own job. And you know, you eat healthy, lots of fruits and vegetables, They're, they make their job really easy, so you don't have to you know, resource all of them, and, and you can conserve some energy for healing the body and doing other things. But typically, we're spending 75% of our energy to feed that crew that's picking the nutrients out of your food. So if you start having a cheat, if you have a cheat day once in a while, which is fine, challenge the system, see how good it works, okay? What happens is the foreman blows the whistle and tells everybody, step back, nothing to get here, this is all crap, we're gonna let this go right by us, don't mess with it, don't worry, everything's gonna be all right, go take a break. So we take a break, and then the next meal comes down the pipe. Hey, we got fruits and vegetables again. Let's go back to work. But if you keep giving it junk all the time, it's like they're sitting around. They need to work, right? And so they're going to have to say, all right, time to go dumpster diving. You know, let's, this is so gross and disgusting. There's so many things in here that I don't want to touch, but I need my vitamin K. So I got to search through all of this and try to get that vitamin K. And so don't make it so hard on your coworkers that are doing their best job to get the nutrients out of what you're putting in. Nobody else is going to be a supply sergeant for you like you can be. And the things that enter your mouth are the, really the only things you do have control over. So you've got to take accountability for that and not blame anybody else 
for what you're eating and why you're eating it, okay? We all have the ability to do amazing things. Our gut is leaking toxins, and those toxins are getting to your brain. If nothing else, and you don't care about gut health, care about brain health, because once your brain health goes, you don't have a quality of life anymore, and that is not where you want to end up. So let's talk about how amazing our body is for a second. We literally take the material we have and we can make over 200,000 different proteins in our body. How awesome is that? I, I sit around and I, just, I love the stats and I love how fast things change and, and repair themselves. But the fact that we can make 200,000 different proteins, even in the dark, is even remote, only wonderful. Now, we do that with only 20,000 genes. Now, that is such a little amount of genes. Now, to compare that, a flea literally has 30,000 genes. So typically, we're two-thirds as complicated as a flea on a genetic level. Now, to put that into perspective, um, yet we make these 200,000 proteins out of just 26 simple amino acids. So think of that like the alphabet. Some letters um, are not so important. Other letters like vowels you know, are super important. You take one vowel out of the equation, now all of a sudden you've lost the ability to take, to, um, to have tens of thousands of words. And so some of them are very, very critical. So now we have 26 amino acids that we need to build all of the proteins in our body, but nine of them we just can't get because we can't make them ourselves. They're called essential because we need to get them from our food. Now, Here's the problem coming full circle. If our plants are not producing the amino acids that are essential for us to build all these other proteins, oh my goodness, what are we gonna do when we need to build the protein to fight this infection or to fight this disease or to fight this condition? We're building proteins all the time to go attack and fight these things. What happens when we don't have our army to do that and we don't have the building blocks to even build the cells? We need proteins, vitamins, and minerals as, as the brick and mortar to build every single cell in your body. So if you're missing and lacking the ability to produce the cell, i.e. we're just not eating good, you can't think that you're just going to make it out of thin air. It doesn't just happen that way. You have to be a good steward to your body. So my protocol for the last 40-something years, since my parents raised me right, was I have a handful of supplements, and I have my green drink and with all my proteins and things in that. And every morning, it's kind of a ritual. I am thanking the Lord above for giving me wisdom to make sure that I'm covered today for everything my body needs to thrive and to make sure that I'm giving it all the building blocks that I know it needs. Now, the rest of the day, I promise and vow to eat clean and avoid toxins at all costs. But I'm not going to be that intelligent to know how much of what foods do I need to eat throughout the day to make sure my body gets what I need to thrive. We live in a very modern time. We can get amazing quality supplements that can make sure we have our building blocks. And so that's life insurance for you. I don't look at it as how much does this cost or does that cost. I don't care what that part costs. That's the most important. Even when I was permanently disabled, lost everything, living in an apartment and barely getting by, I never skimped on my nutrients and my supplements because I knew as soon as I gave that up, there is no hope of me ever getting my life back again. And I, I was too important to ever skimp on that. So we would go without food before I go without my supplements. Now, on top of all of that, glyphosate blocks um, our amino acids from being able to enter these pathways. And so this is really just not a good thing. Because of glyphosate on our body, or in our world, and it's in literally 80% of our food chain, because of this, we lose one species on our planet every 20 minutes. That's crazy. In this one hour talk that we're doing now, we've lost three species of either plants, insects, animals, uh, or such in this last hour. And that is an alarming rate. You know what though? We have the ability to stop that and to turn it around because if we don't, human beings will be on that list. And it's predicted that at the rate we're going now, within 72 years, we'll be the ones that are extinct. We can't live if we're not getting the nutrients back in for our body to do the healing and to keep us alive. So as a result of this, our membranes become unattached. Think of like pulling the Velcro off something that's holding it to the wall and you have a gap behind the Velcro. That's leaky gut. 
okay? And that starts with the sinus cavity and all the way through your intestines. And then the blood vessels also have these membranes on them. Those become unattached and you start leaking bad stuff into the blood. Then the blood brain barrier, which is the holy of holies, it's our holy grail that protects anything from the central nervous system because those cells don't have a turnover rate. Once they're gone, they're gone. Now we know we can do neuroplasticity and stimulate the growth of new brain tissue, but it's not like this tissue has a turnover rate like our red blood cells and our eyeballs and our, and our gums and our teeth and our throat. All of the rest of the cells in our body have a very distinct time in which they're going to completely replace themselves. And the way that process works is when a cell realizes, hey, something just got inside me and it's running around damaging me pretty fast. I'm going to go ahead and commit cell suicide. Please send a stem cell to replace me. And the cell dies called apoptosis. The stem cell comes in and replaces itself. Once that leaky gut happens and these separate, now they become like lonely and alone and they lose those fiber optics that was getting the information from the other cell so their cell phones don't work they're not able to get that so if i'm not getting information to the other cells to tell them i'm in danger and send a replacement i'm on a whole different process now now i better replicate myself because if i die that's the end of my lineage so it's going to start replicating itself fast to try to build a whole nother colony and that's not good that's like cancer and, and and cysts and tumors and all of that stuff and so we want to keep our cells healthy keep these junctions tight keep the velcro tight so the bad stuff doesn't get in and we restore and maintain communication from the cell towers to the mitochondria and then between the cells so we're all on the same page now as a result of leaky gut this causes chronic inflammation at an alarming rate. Our food and our diet that we're eating currently as a society keeps us in a constant state of inflammation. Okay, inflammation is supposed to be in a response to an injury, you know, so the body can heal, get the bad stuff out, and then restore to normal. We're not designed to stay in inflammation all the time. It increases autoimmune disorders. It increases the incidences of autism. It increases Parkinson's disease and MS and dementia. Okay? All of this began simply in a four-year span. And it's, it's amazing now that they've kind of been able to scientifically put all the facts together and make a claim that has held, okay? And so basically in 1992, um, the wonderful world of glyphosate became water soluble. Now, once you make something water soluble, you can't take it back. Once it gets into the ground, into the ground water, and into the streams and rivers and into our water tables, it also evaporates, gets up into the air, and then it's in our clouds and it comes down in acid rain. So. This began in 1992 to 96. Now by 1996, it created a massive explosion of all neurological injuries, okay? Not only in adults, but in every age group across the board. And in just four years, there was an explosive amount of gluten intolerance, celiac conditions popping up, Parkinson's, MS, autoimmune, Alzheimer's, all of these things happened at an alarming rate after the glyphosate entered our groundwater supply. Now, we have a problem because we have six billion people on this planet to feed, and our food is just loaded now with GMOs, glyphosate, pesticides, chemicals, all creating chronic inflammation. How is that problem gonna be fixed by adding more chemicals? Western medicine is managing inflammation. That's where they're so focused on managing inflammation. We know inflammation is bad. Take these meds for this and take this meds for this inflammation rather than instilling health in the person and stopping the cause of inflammation. We're smart enough to know this. We're just not taking responsibility for that. Now, all of this came full circle in 2012. You know, 92 to 96 was when it became mainstream and it just spread like wildfire globally. 80% of the world's population is contaminated with glyphosate. The world's population of food, okay? 80% of our food source, food supply is contaminated. But in 1996, 
uh, or in 2012, Dr. Zach Bush actually had a major discovery. Now, he is a triple board certified medical doctor uh, specialized in chemotherapy and treatments as well as endocrinology and gut health and microbiome. And, you know, after spending so much time in chemo with patients in the very last end of their life and trying to, you know, make that more comfortable and see how we, how it all works and the immune response and all of that, he found um, that they were producing, uh, or he found chemicals in the soil that looked like chemotherapy drug. And so they were looking at subsoil way below the surface in the deserts of Arizona, and they were finding the carbon backbone of ancient soil that literally had over 40,000 different bacteria and fungi, you know, independently. So it was like a whole colony of 40,000 different strands of bacteria. And all of their genetic information was encoded into these carbon backbones. And so we found that the reason they people were healthy and were able to keep good healthy guts was because we had such a diverse colony. But these, these colonies of these fungi and bacteria under a microscope looked almost exactly like the drugs they were using for chemotherapy. And so they put the connection that it turns out that these bugs in our gut are literally our best form of medicine that we can put into our body. And so they form a communication that supports the gut lining and keeps the tight junctions tight. This was a big, big breakthrough. And so with that, you know, we learn more about bacteria and fungi and how they live in the unprotected space outside the cell, not inside our cell, and they control intercellular communication. Remember, they're like the cell towers out there, and they communicate with the mitochondria inside our cells. And so we need just as bad for our gut to communicate to that mitochondria and our cell lining as you need to connect your phone to a cell phone tower. Now, as soon as your mitochondria is considered the cell phone and the tower is communicating to it, but if you ever take your phone and you go seven miles away from a tower, guess what? You don't have a signal anymore. This is a problem. We start to panic and lose our minds. Like, oh my gosh, I can't get my texts. I can't get the phone calls. What about my emails? When you're not connected to the antenna, we start to degrade and your cell phone becomes more and more useless. Okay, all my data is becoming outdated. I'm not getting updates anymore. I can't communicate to anybody. I can't even check emails and all my emails are being, you know, I'm not getting any new ones. And so without our intimate connection with the fungi and the bacteria, we don't have communication from cells to cells and we start creating all these problems of autoimmune disorders and neurological degeneration diseases and all of that. So the simple truth is, is we're barely even human. We have about 70 to 100 trillion human cells in us, but we literally have over a quadrillion bacteria cells, and we have 10 times that amount in fungi cells. And so it's the bacteria and the fungi that really dictate how our 100 trillion cells are gonna function as an organism together, and also how they're gonna replicate themselves and replace themselves as soon as things start going bad so that we can maintain the optimal version of ourselves. So this is a great stuff. So what about genetics? You know, we talk about epigenetics and what causes one cell to activate a gene or not. And what does that mean? When a gene activates, it means that it got orders to create a certain uh, sequence of proteins. And its job is to go create some proteins to fight this condition. So depending on the weather outside the cell, the genetic makeup of the DNA is telling different proteins to be made. Okay, so 35 to 40% of all of our on off switches, whether a gene is going to turn on or off, it's controlled by that communication between bacterial and fungi. So it literally does matter what you eat. Eating clean food, organic food, and avoiding toxins at all rate plays the largest factor in whether you're going to turn these genes on or off. Okay, um, now outside of your clean food, 50% of that equation of whether you're turning the genes on or off 
deals with your emotions. And so not your thought so much as when you feel that thought. <laughs> Once that happens, you're creating, again, an environment outside your cells full of inflammation and stress hormones and all of that. It's communicating the DNA, hey, make a different sequence of proteins next time because we need to fight this issue instead of whatever you are going to do. Okay, so we want our outside of our environment to be as healthy as possible. When I look outside, I'm like, man, it's a beautiful sunny day. No worries out here. Just make the best version of me next time around. I appreciate that very much. And then 10 to 15%, that little difference in there, that's going to be the other lifestyle stuff. Like I need to make sure I'm getting proper rest. I need to be exercising and drinking lots of clean water and all the things that we were raised thinking was the whole picture. Like it only matters that I have a good lifestyle. And well, you know, I guess lifestyle is kind of food too. So lifestyle really could be up to 50% of your including what's going into our mouth um, outside of being active and all of that. But regardless, it's a much bigger equation than that. We have to take the environment outside of ourselves and make it healthy. By doing that, we're not only going to have better emotions and better control of our hormones and emotional state, but we're also being able to digest our food and get the best out of it and keep our organism running tip top okay and so that's all so important so the sad truth is healthy animals exhibit signs of autism in the last few weeks on the feed line so even if you're buying grass-fed animals they're grass-fed the majority of their life but in the last few days weeks or months sometimes they're led into feed lines and they're fed all the glyphosate and, and to fatten them up and all of the gluten in these grains and stuff and literally they see the personalities and everything about these cows and animals change. Like a cow eating grass fed all the time, you can walk up to the fence, look them right in the eye, they'll stare at you, you can tell they're happy, they're paying attention. You know, as soon as they start eating all that junk and they're fattening them up, they're skittish, they, they won't look at you, they're looking all over the place, they, they, they're, they're not happy, right? And we're creating all this stress in them and, and destroying those tight junctions, putting all the bad stuff into their cells, making them secrete all these horrible hormones that are fighting disease and rather than being happy and healthy hormones. And then we're metabolizing that. So we're getting it. It's not so much what we eat. It's what we eat ate. I mean, we have to pay attention to that. And if we're eating things that if, if we're eating clean, but yet with all of our organic vegetables and stuff, but then we're eating meats, that we're fed all the junk, it's still getting into us. It's still affecting us, and that is a problem. 5% of all your microRNA that's determining how that next version of your next cell is gonna be comes from the last meal you ate. So think about that in trying to be the best version you can, eating better, making better food choices. One simple round of antibiotics is gonna be for the next year, make you 25% more susceptible to being depressed and 19% more susceptible to having anxiety. Okay, that's big from just one simple round of an antibiotic because it's destroying all that good stuff along with it. And two rounds of antibiotics is going to increase depression by over 60%. So again, a lot of you say, well, hey, I haven't had an antibiotic in years. Yeah, but you're eating meat that's loaded with antibiotics and you're eating stuff that's not organic, which is glyphosate, which is an antibiotic. So you're eating antibiotics all the time and it's keeping the inflammation and it's creating leaky gut in all three membranes and creating problems in your life. Okay, this is very easy to turn around. These membranes replace themselves quickly. We just have to make a stand and say, you know what? I'm going to stop eating that and I'm going to start doing this. Okay, in 1980... The U.S. reached its maximum amount of prescriptions that they can write for antibiotics. So we haven't been able to write more since then. So, and even the, they even admit that 75% of all the prescriptions they're writing are unnecessary because it's probably viral or it's not even a bacterial infection that was the problem. And so we're only allowed to write 833 prescriptions per thousand people. So we've maxed that out a long time ago. And even with that, just just the people at that dose, we're producing in the United States 7 million pounds of antibiotics every year. We're consuming 7 million pounds for humans. That's alarming. Any more than that, the government says, no, not healthy, society can't live, can't work that way. 
well, what about the 30 million pounds we're putting in our animals that we're eating? And what about the 4.5 billion pounds that we put with glyphosate every year? This is crazy when we understand the truth. And the sad truth is Monsanto knows that, and they have so many lawsuits against them that they sold out and they sold to Bayer. Yes, Bayer aspirin, like the, like the aspirins. And, you know, they have a little shady past. They are the first ones that patented heroin and have to deal with that. And then they had, um, you know, the simple fact is that they're the ones that invented aspirin. And more deaths are um, contributed to aspirin, aspirin than any other drug in the world. So they have that on their shoulders too. So now they have glyphosate. And the cool thing about that is we have a solution to this. So 80% of our world's food supply is contaminated with glyphosate. The GMOs will completely destroy your soil in seven years. And then it makes it unhabitable. So they have to do things to it. Um, with the addition of additional flavors and artificial flavors, our food can be grown in soil that's completely depleted of all nutrients. And then they just inject things into them to make them look green, green and colorful again. And, and then they inject flavor into them to make them actually taste like an apple again, for instance. This is really a problem, and that's the sad truth. But I promised you that I don't give you sad truth without also bringing in the good news. So uh, once we've identified a problem, hey, we can discover multiple ways and multiple solutions around the problem. So the first thing is we just need to start growing our own food. You know, we're very excited about that. We love growing our own wheatgrass and sunflower sprouts and have the old garden tower and we can grow lots of different things. And so I know what I'm growing. I know what the quality of water I'm using. I know, you know, the nutrients that are, are in the soil or that we're using and so forth. But um, the average age of farmers in our country is 67. So this can be a problem too. We need a lot of youngsters coming in and starting to farm. And it is starting to happen. So we can support local farms. This is so huge. So the interesting thing about this is 10 years ago, only 1% of the farms and the produce in our country was organic. Today, it's about 4 or 5%. Well, if we can get it to where 16% of the country demands organic and that's all they buy, it will absolutely bankrupt the Monsanto and Bayer and this whole glyphosate thing because they will not be profitable and it just won't continue. And we will regain our earth and have that connection to the earth and the original bacteria and things that are supposed to be growing in there. So there's a website that Zach Bush created, uh, a movement, I should say, not even a website, called farmersfootprint.us. And this is uh, an amazing organization that can connect you to local farmers in your area so you can support them and that you can buy foods from them. And the more people that just demand organic stuff that's grown without the glyphosate and so forth, then the more people we can get to get this 16% and actually save our species as we know it. So another amazing thing about Farmer's Footprint is that we know for those farmers that for whatever reason had to you know, go the other route and use the fertilizers and the chemicals and the GMOs and all of that, you know, they kind of paint themselves into a corner. We can't break free because we can't afford it. We can't have a season or two or three, which literally it takes three seasons of not growing to allow generations of different weeds to come in and fix the problem. And so a Farmer's Footprint is an amazing organization because they will literally pay farmers to not grow for three years. And so money that, we, that they make and support, all the dollars that are, that are raised to support this movement, a third of it goes to supporting doctor, farmers that want to convert into an organic, self-sustaining farm again. And they have all the tools and resources necessary to help them do that and pay them their normal wages that they would make with their crops during those three seasons that it takes to correct the soil. So that's an amazing thing that we can all do to really change the way that we're thinking about our food and the way that we're demanding what we get. It's only raised from 1% to 5% because so many people are on board with understanding that, you know what, I know that even organic has some pesticides and has some chemicals in it because it's been rained on by glyphosate and stuff, but it's like 80% less. And so there's so much less. And so if I could choose to have 
all the toxins are 80% less, I would take 80% less every time. So we just need to make that movement and do that. There's another great resource that we love and use, and it's called Thrive Market. This allows people to get organic foods at wholesale prices delivered right to their home. So check out the thrivemarket.com as well and farmersfootprint.us. These are two amazing resources to help us start eating and clean diet and then getting more in touch with earth again and with our food and, and there's something magical about growing your own food and pulling it from the garden having it it's just it's 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 a connection to the earth that we've lost and we need that the other things we can do is just get outside more go for a hike get in the mountains go near streams go near lakes you get exposed to so many good bacteria and fungi just by being out in the wilderness and being connected to the dirt and in all of that we need to be exposed to that to keep the good biome growing we want to have 40,000 different microbiome in our gut not just the acidophilus I take 5 billion of that's not a colony that's one single strand so we want to get out more and, and eat more and eat more things that were literally grown from the earth now I know a lot of you guys watching might say you know it all sounds great and I would love to eat organic but you know what I just simply can't afford it so what are my options when I don't have the extra discretionary income to buy the more expensive food well, there's a great website and it's as an app that you can get on your phone or your iPad or what have you, and it's called Healthy Living. It's by a company called EWG, and they have what's called the Clean 15 and the Dirty Dozen. And so I wanted to bring these to you, but I urge you, go check out their website and check out that app. With the app, you can literally type in any product that you're about to buy or scan the QR code or the, the barcode on the product, and it'll show you the product. It'll show you three different categories of how safe that product is. Uh, was it grown with chemicals? Is it, you know, is it safe to eat? And, and then it, are the things in there, that, how healthy are the actual ingredients anyway? And so it gives you an idea of the choices that you're making and what are the warning things I need to know about that food? And so it might be a little neurotic for some people, but you know, if you're on this quest to eat organic, it really is a helpful tool to know what are going to be your staples. You know, use it the first time you find a new product that you're going to be adding into your recipes and just make sure that you're getting the best one. But the truth is that, you know, there's so many good alternatives to things with gluten in them you know, and things that were grown with glyphosate, you know, as far as organic and then gluten-free, almost everything you can buy gluten-free now and not ever feel deprived. Now, two decades ago, anything gluten-free tasted like cardboard. I'm not going to kid you. It was not like, oh, this is a pizza. It's so good. I'm eating pizza. But nowadays, you know, so many different companies and restaurants and products out there are gluten-free because they know how harmful the gluten is to our gut and to our overall health. So if you're, if you're going to buy stuff that's not organic, um, avocados are going to be the cleanest just because of the way they're grown and protected. Uh, sweet corn, as long as it's not GMO, is, the, is also clean. Uh, pineapple, sweet peas, onions, papayas, and so forth. So the further on down the line you go, the little bit more contaminated they get. Now, outside of these clean 15 are the ones ones that we want to buy more of if we're not organic. We definitely want to avoid these. And strawberries, number one, please don't eat strawberries if they're not organic. They're going to have the highest level of pesticides and chemicals in them. And then spinach and kale. These are things that people think, oh my gosh, I love, I'm, I'm so healthy. I eat sandwiches and with, with my salad in it, or I eat salads every day, and I just eat tons of spinach and kale, and I make kale chips, and I do kale in my smoothies, and they think they're being all healthy, but guess what? If you're not buying it organic, you're poisoning yourself. It, it can sometimes be worse than the, than the nutrients that you're getting out of the food. And so these are two things that, you know, if you're going to buy organic and you can't afford to be 100% organic, at least pick the things at the top of this list that you consume and start there. You know, you won't notice switching a few things over that you can see more of initially. And then eventually your priorities will change enough and you'll care enough about your body that you're going to do everything and anything that you can do to not put any more poisons in my body than I, than, than's necessary. So. 
Another amazing thing that I love is this product called Restore. Now, Zach Bush, the one that I mentioned, has this amazing camera that they can hold it to your gut and, and look at your microbiome and look at that, that layer, that membrane, and see if you have your tight junctions or not. So we can see somebody with glyphosate, and then we take this product Restore, and literally within 10 minutes, those tight junctions come back, and it brings the product back. Now, this is not loaded with antibi with, with 40 different thousand microbiome. It has the carbon backbone of these organisms that were, were from the soil, and it immediately activates the cell phone tower. And so by taking this, it communicates with the gut, activates the tower, immediately starts spot welding these tight junctions back and restoring your gut lining. So this is an amazing product. You can go to uh, ZachBushMD.com or you can learn more about it from the Good News Doctor site as well. And so here is another example of that restore. So this was a patient that uh, they gave restore within 10 minutes, you can see how the lack of tight junctions, that's the yellow or the, um, the green octagons you're seeing that are connecting all of the cells together. The, the lack of those on the left, because glyphosate destroys and degrades that and rips the Velcro away from them so they don't connect to the neighboring cells. And again, within 10 minutes, this is such a simple product. We all do this, and this is one of the foundational products that we help with all of our patients first because this actually builds that microbiome back and makes it super healthy. We use a nose spray whenever I'm in public, you know, going through airports, getting on airplanes, just to get the good, the good response in my sinus membranes to make them healthy so I'm not breathing in other people's junk and having it get into my bloodstream where I don't want it. So glyphosate's an ama uh, a horrible thing, but we have an amazing amazing product now that can really help us restore all of that. So with that, I want to thank you for your time this evening and for actually caring enough about your gut to get on this call and to learn a few things. Hopefully you've learned them enough that you're going to make some decisions about the things that go in your mouth. If you do that, then it was all worth it because again, like I mentioned before, you're the only steward that cares enough about what goes into your body. And you're the only one that has the ability to turn it around. If you have a chronic condition that you've been suffering with and you're on multiple medications, by all means, this is the easiest thing for you to turn around. Start getting back into planting and growing your own food, supporting local farms, eating more vegetables and fruits. Do what your body was designed to do and, and get the nutrients out of, out of the earth, what we need it to come from. Avoid the things in boxes, okay? Avoid the, the frozen dinners and the things that you're having to cook in microwaves. We want to try to stay as close to nature as possible. And you're going to be amazed how your chronic condition can turn around so quickly. It is really amazing what happens when your gut gets healthy. 90% of all the neurotransmitters in your body that are sending information to your brain, guess what? They're in your gut. We go back to the mouse and keyboards is your gut. Your brain is the CPU. So all the things you do to help support a healthy biome and a healthy gut is going to make your brain last longer. It's going to avoid the toxins getting into your brain because guess what? Aluminum, which is the number one heavy metal that we're all exposed to in the air, it jumps on glyphosate and has a free ride right through that blood-brain barrier into your brain. And you get too much of that up in there, you're going to go downhill fast neurologically. And so this is not the solution. We need to eat better, take the things that restore our linings to keep them tight so the barrier between us and our environment only lets the selective things in that are supposed to get in at the time I need it. That's what's important. So hope that helps everybody really start to change in the way you think about your food and what's going into your mouth and how hard I want to make that on my gut and the two tons of food that I'm eating, how hard do I want to make that on my body to be able to digest and get the best stuff out of it? So until next time, have a great couple of weeks and I enjoyed doing this presentation for each and every one of you and have a blessed day. Talk to you later. Bye-bye now.